Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on what's new in Clover DX 5.6. Presenting the webinar today is Branyo Repchek and uh, he is our Director of Sales Engineering here at Clover DX. He's going to be taking us through a quick overview of the new features and updates in the latest Clover DX release. Uh, so just a quick housekeeping note before we start, Branyo will be answering questions at the end so if you do have any please just use the Q&A box to submit them. So with that, over to you Branyo. Thank you, Tessa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me on the webinar today. As Tessa mentioned, I'll first go through an overview uh, of what we have new in Clover DX 5.6, and then I'll show you a quick demo of some of those features that we've implemented in the latest release. As usually, we have stuck to our release schedule, so we released uh, the latest version, Clover DX 5.6, last week, uh, and we still intend to keep the schedule for the rest of the year. So even though all kinds of things are happening around us. We still manage to deliver Clover uh, as we planned. And we do not plan any disruptions to our release schedule later in the year. So let's have a look at quick highlights uh, of what's new in Clover DX. Uh, we have basically three large features that have changed. And of course, there are many smaller changes. And you can see full list of those uh, in our release notes that are available on the website, you can see link over here and you can very easily find that uh, from our website. The first, uh, we've made continuous improvements to uh, data applications. We expanded the user interface for those with all kinds of new options that allow you to use a wider range of different kinds of parameters. And we also implemented a wide labeling or branding support so that you can very easily change the, the front end of the data apps to suit whatever uh, visual style you need to to fit a little bit better within your organization design guidelines. A major new feature uh, has also been improving a lot of enhancements into our CTL language, uh, namely adding support for tree or JSON like structures. This support allows you to very nicely work with any tree like structure, for example, JSON, BSON, XML, and similar. Uh, fully in CTL, you can dynamically look through the data, investigate what's in it, manipulate it, create new records and so on. And finally, this is not related exactly to 5.6, but the timing worked just right for us. Uh, we have added support for uh, Amazon Marketplace and Azure Marketplace deployments, uh, meaning that you can now find Clover DX there directly or rather Clover DX server and very quickly can deploy uh, your server either for testing or even in production environment if you want to. So let's have a look at uh, more details about the improvements. The first that I'll talk about uh, are data apps. Uh, as I mentioned, we've improved the user interface quite a lot. Uh, I'll show you the demo later, uh, but basically the improvements relate to new parameter types that we've added before we were able to use, for example, dates uh, strings. Now you can do numbers, including validation. You can do drop downs, check boxes that represent booleans, and so on. Uh, we've also improved how data apps display their output. Uh, the basic functionality of displaying status page state, but we've added formatting for XML and JSON data. You can see an example over here on the screenshot. And we've also added display of tabular data like CSVs. Uh, that are displayed in an actual table that you can uh, you can scroll through, so not just like a flat uh, flat file. And as I mentioned before, we've added white labeling support. This is something that will bring data apps even closer to your business users, because you can now very easily skin data apps, anything within those, to match your uh, your company branding. So the users who will be using those don't even need to know that it's Clover behind. And the best thing is that it doesn't touch anything else in the Clover server. Uh, so it only skins that part, the data apps part of Clover. So you don't have to worry about breaking something uh, if you change the layout of the data apps. Another huge change relates to the added support for tree-like structures in CTL. Uh, we did this by introducing a new data type in CTL called variant. This is a data type that can represent any kind of data, whether it's a simple uh, value like a string, number, or date, 
but also represent arrays, uh, maps, or maps of arrays, and so on. So basically, it allows you to store any kind of structure in the variant, and you can then dynamically examine the contents of the variant, uh, for example, by looking at specific properties or grabbing the whole subtree uh, of, of the structure that you have stored there. We have direct support for parsing JSON and VSON documents into the variant. And of course, you can also go reverse and create JSON or VSON out of the variant that you have there. I'll show you how this can be used <clears throat> very easily to uh, investigate the structure of a data that you get back from a web service call, for example, which is a very interesting use case. Uh, with this, we've made a lot of other improvements to CTL that allow you to a little bit better use its functionality. For example, we've implemented try-catch statements that allow you to much better handle errors in CTL. Instead of using callbacks as we've had so far, we now have full support for try-catch with proper exception handling so you can very naturally uh, catch an exception as it happens and handle it in some way. We've introduced syntax for constants so you can make your intentions with, uh, with regards to how certain variable is used much clearer without having to use some sort of naming convention. You can just mark it as a constant and it will not be modifiable. And we've also initialized complex maps and lists and their initializers. Uh, this is something that also helps you uh, build your variant data structures and work with those. So all of these will help you uh, much better manipulate complex data in Clover. <clears throat> Another feature that will be very useful, especially in the environment where you have more complex runtime environment at hand and need to manage your jobs on the server, uh, is the ability to change execution properties directly in the designer. Uh, this is something that was already possible in the server. It was called config properties before uh, the page looked similarly to this one, except it wasn't as clean as, as it is now, uh, but it was only available on the server and sometimes harder to understand. We've now unified all the properties into a single page so you can very easily see where the properties come from, whether they have been inherited from the sandbox or whether they have been configured just for the specific job. And you can also manage those properties in the designer, in the outline view of, of everything that you create there. Uh, this is something that will be especially useful if you need to, for example, limit execution, uh, which can be done through max running concurrently, which is, I think, the most commonly used property out of these. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, uh, we've added support for uh, Amazon and Azure Marketplace deployments. Uh, this allows you to very easily search the marketplace for Clover DX uh, and create your own instance of Clover DX server. Uh, this is bring your own license style deployment, meaning that you have to have your own license uh, and you can deploy it in the cloud very easily. In both cases, we provide templates that allow you to very quickly select, for example, the server size, memory, disk space, and so on. But if you want to, you can also configure any other aspect of that and uh, can use the automated deployment scripts that we've created for this so that you can create and tailor the environments exactly as you want. This is one of the features that is not tied strictly to Clover DX 5.6, uh, but rather to all the releases that, that uh, are there. We start with Clover DX uh, 5.5.2, which was released, I think, about two weeks ago, uh, so that you can find as well uh, in the marketplaces. So <clears throat> whether you want to try the latest version or the previous one, you can, you can test it through the marketplace. And as usually, we've made hundreds of other changes, whether there are small bug fixes or improvements throughout the whole product. Uh, there are two larger changes that relate to uh, something that might cause compatibility issues. The first one is that we removed support for uh, version 1 and 1.1 of TLS. These protocols are both considered insecure and outdated so data service can no longer use them when you deploy data services as HTTPS. Um, I hope that not many customers have been affected by this and that everyone already used newer protocols for, uh, for hosting their data services. And 
Another change in CTL is that we disallow now variable shadowing. This is what you can see over here on the screenshot. Previously, this was valid code where you can create a variable called value in inner scope, for example, in a function, in a loop or in a condition and kind of hide the value that was there before. This is now no longer allowed. This aligns, for example, with how Java does it, right? This is not allowed in Java either. Uh, and this is something that helps us improve the, the performance and quality of the code uh, if you want to generate Java code out of CTL. Now, with all that said, uh, let's now switch to Clover and show, I'll show you uh, some of the features live. So let's first have a look at the, <clears throat> at the data apps and the improvements made there. As before, we have data apps catalog that allows you to show all the applications that you have available. In my case, I have three applications. This is the default skin for data apps, right? That one hasn't changed really. But as I mentioned, it's also possible to rebrand uh, your data apps to look completely differently. Uh, to that, I'm running a separate server uh, that uses this kind of branding and the, the branding or scanning here allows you to change every aspect of the, of the screen, whether you want to replace logos, change colors, or even completely change the layout of the elements on the page, you can do that very easily. In my case, what I did was use a little bit of uh, CSS magic to change the layout of the page and a little bit of JavaScript to hide some of the elements uh, like some of the text that appears here by default, I added footer and so on. So with this kind of uh, functionality, you can very easily change anything to fit the visual style that your company uses and users of data apps do not need to know that Clover is running behind. The functionality besides that stays exactly, uh, exactly the same. Right? So uh, you don't need to change the code of your data apps at all when you change uh, when you change the design or layout. <clears throat> the features that, that we've added also allow you to change or have more different parameter types. You can see, for example, drop downs over here uh, that have not been possible before. So I can select a drop down and very useful feature that allows you to uh, validate your data as users type it in. For example, this is supposed to be a number uh, from one to 500. So of course, if I type something large and switch next, it will tell me that it's too large, or if I type uh, some value that is not a number, it will warn me as well. So this is something that, that will allow you to very quickly notify users that the value they are entering is not correct uh, and they need to fix it. Of course, we have checkboxes and a few other uh, types. I'll run this application. And while this is running and generated some data for me in the background, uh, let's have a look at the data app itself. Uh, the one feature I wanted to show you is the, is the validation that is available over here in the parameter settings. You can just click on a parameter. Uh, let's pick, for example, the integer one. And depending on the type that you have, you can specify different kinds of validation options. For example, for numbers, you can specify the range. Clover already knows how a number should look like, so it will know how to validate the format. If you add a string parameter, uh, you have more options. For example, you can even use regular expressions, length of the string, uh, and so on, or case sensitivity, and all kinds of other, other features. So this allows you to quite uh, in detail validate whether uh, what your users are entering into the form makes sense. And as before, you can always validate your data further uh, as your job runs. So you can very easily have some sort of validation built into the job uh, and produce error messages when the data does not match what you expected and the validation built into the data service does not support that complicated validation as you need. So my application has now finished. And in here you can see one of the other changes, uh, support for highlighting the syntax of, uh, of JSON, XML and CSV or tabular data. In this case, we can see JSON here. I can expand the data so that it fills the whole screen. If it's something bigger, I might want to search through it. And as before, I can very easily download the data if I wanted to do something else uh, with that. Uh, <clears throat> another very interesting feature that we have added uh, is the ability to configure a JavaScript to run 
as, uh, as the application is being loaded. So I have configured a JavaScript to run when this application, the effort report one uh, loads and the JavaScript that I have there populates these two parameters with their default values to be current month, beginning of the month and end of the month. This is something that, that cannot be set statically because it can change as the application is reloaded. And what is more interesting is that my JavaScript actually goes and calls a web service uh, to populate the dropdown over here, right? So the data that I get here is loaded from a database. So this is something that will allow you to put basically any kind of data on the form, whether it's something as simple as I have here, uh, grabbing employee names from an employee database and populating a dropdown, or even changing the layout of the form, adding or removing elements. Again, you have full control of what is happening. Uh, with that said, this is of course considered a very advanced feature <clears throat> because it's possible to very easily do something that, that, uh, that breaks the layout over here since you have full control over that. So just be careful about that, but this will allow you to build very nice and complex data applications. And the way to configure this is in the properties of the data application, uh, you can see path to in the injected JS file uh, and the file itself uh, is something that needs to be in the sandbox, right? So this is the one that I have for the effort report <clears throat> and it will be configured when I open uh, that application. And so you can see the path over here. Now that was everything about data applications. Let's now look at uh, at new features in CTL, whether they relate to variant or uh, to other, um, other functionality that we have. Let's start with something very simple. I'll start with a basic example of variant and we'll show you how that works. Uh, in this case, I have a very simple JSON output. Uh, this one is the same as the output produced by uh, the, the data type that I have there. And what I've done here, is simply extracted the value of some of the elements uh, in, the, uh, in the JSON structure. And so the way that you work with it is that you parse your JSON through parse JSON function, assign it into a variant, and you can then navigate uh, the structure either dynamically by querying the keys, the values, and so on, or if you know the structure, how it is organized, in my case, this is an, um, array of, of elements, I can very easily access the values directly here and cast them to any type I need if I need to write them somewhere else. Uh, so if we look at how this one runs, we'll get the JSON as a single string over here on the input. And so I have a single record with the JSON represented as a string. And on the output, I have three values or three records that have been created based on what is in the JSON. In this case, this is something that could have been easily done uh, even before with components such as uh, JSON extract or JSON reader. Uh, but there are of course more complex use cases which would have been uh, much harder before. This is a more advanced version of the previous example. In this case, the JSON that we have here uh, is actually fully dynamic. The names of the attributes change depending on what is in the data. It's actually a response from a HubSpot API uh, where you have different properties represented as, uh, as objects within the JSON structure. So if you add or remove properties in your HubSpot account, you'll get different objects in there. Uh, this is something that was quite hard to handle with, uh, with previous components in Clover, but with the, with the new uh, functions in CTL, we can very easily extract, for example, all property names, their current values. And since HubSpot also provides history, we can look at that. In this case, I extracted history as again as a JSON fragment because I didn't need it, but I can very easily add another component and for example, handle that separately if I wanted to. And again, the way this is done uh, is quite simple. You can see a little bit more advanced usage of the JSON functionality over here. Again, I parse the JSON here. And since I know that, that uh, it's an object called properties, I ask for its content and get all the keys. This is again a variant, so I can iterate through that. And you can see that I'm grabbing uh, elements, successive elements of, uh, of my variant, holding the property names. 
and just grabbing some values of that and this is how it can be done. So this is something that allows me to parse any JSON regardless of what I configure in my HubSpot. This will work all the time. And of course, all the usual uh, nice features of CTL like uh, proper handling of null values and everything else is there. So if you ask for uh, a property that doesn't exist, you will get a null instead of, uh, instead of an error and you can handle that in your own way if you want to. Okay, and um, last thing, let's have a look at how try catch works uh, and a few of other uh, functions. This is a very simple example that generates random strings that look like a date, but not all of them are. So if I run it, I'll see what happens. If I didn't use try catch or any other error handling, it would fail uh, very quickly because for example, we can see that this is a date with day 49, which is not a valid date of course. And the conversion uh, is attempted and try catch is used to catch the exception and then report if any exception happens. So you can see that most of the data was actually, uh, was actually invalid. And we can have a look at how that looks like in CTL. Uh, so this is a try, catch. Uh, we can use catch with CTL exception in case you want to use, for example, message or location like row, column, and so on. Uh, that's similar to what you can see in Java, for example. Uh, in our case, there's only one exception, right? So you can always catch only CTL exceptions. So it doesn't make sense to define your own custom exception types. And we do not have a finally block, right? So something like, uh, like this is not supported. Finally, it's, it's not uh, available in Clover. With this functionality, you can basically implement the same uh, functionality that you had with callback functions before. You can even combine them although this is a little bit more natural and allows you to handle the error closer to where it happens. Another interesting feature that's visible over here uh, is the const or constants. Uh, this is something that allows you to designate a variable as a constant. By default, we use uppercase uh, <clears throat> names for those similarly like in Java. And if you try to assign into this kind of uh, variable, you of course uh, get an error saying that you cannot do that. And so the caller will tell you that you are trying to assign to a constant. Uh, this is something that will help you quite a bit when you have more complex interfaces to, to kind of uh, let the users of the interface know what the values are about. And similarly, you can see the initializers for more complex data types. In this case, I'm initializing a map. Uh, so we've added a syntax that allows you to use uh, kind of an arrow operator uh, to designate map elements and it's very easy to add new ones. This is an integer to a string so I can do uh, something like this All right? to add map elements. This was not available before you had to use function uh, to, to basically add elements to the map in similar way. Uh, this initialization extends to any complex data structure. You can even initialize variant like this which is very useful if you want to work with that uh, in some way. So you can, for example, do this will create a variant of string to string. And then since this is a variant, I can also do this. All right, so this is this allows me to mix and match types, basically mapping string to string and then integer to string. And this is the same functionality that you can use when working with JSON or other tree-like structures. And finally, the last thing I have, just a like a quick mention, uh, is the deployment of Clover in the marketplace. This is, for example, Clover server created with default settings uh, in Azure marketplace. You can see that it's running automatically on HTTPS. And so you get the security built into it. And this is the, uh, the address that I've selected for it. You have, of course, quite a lot of configuration options to how you can set up your server. Right, and that's everything as far as the demo goes. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, one thing that, that we, of course, are always uh, happy to provide is any help with uh, moving your Clover code to newer versions or when you want to just play with it, uh, we'll be happy to connect with you and give you any assistance to, for example, migrating code to, uh, to use some of the newer features 
testing, providing reviews. And as usual, this is fully remote, so you don't have to travel anywhere, uh, and which especially in these times is something that, that's uh, a very nice benefit of trying Clover in this way. <clears throat> Tessa, back to you. Yep, thanks, Brenya. Hope you all found that useful. Um, we haven't had any questions come in, um, so I guess if there aren't any, we'll wrap up for today. So again, thank you, Brenya, for taking us through the new features, and thank you all for attending. We hope to see you at our next webinar.